Father, we adore you. King of glory, we exalt you. There is none like you. You are holy and you are mighty. You are just and you are faithful. God, we lift up your name and we magnify your name together. We just want to be with you. If you don't show up, Holy Spirit, if you don't make residence, there is no point in the rest of this. So we ask you, Holy Ghost, to overflow from within. You said rivers of living water would overflow from within our bellies. Pour out, God. Pour out in this place. Overflow in this place. Drown out every dry thing in this place. Let this be a place where nothing that is not like you can reside. Father, for we know that unclean spirits roam through dry places, so we bind up the drought in Jesus' name, and we loose the rivers of living water to flow, to flow, to flow, but whatsoever we bind on earth, with we know it's bound in heaven. Whatsoever we loose on earth, we know it's loosed in heaven. So Father, have your way in our hearts. Have your way in this place. Have your way in our lives. Touch our ears to hear. Touch our eyes to see. Father, let our hearts be good soil to receive everything that you have for us. And we are ready. Father, make us ready. Make us ready to receive. Make us ready, God, to absorb. Make us ready to have roots take it in us by you. We bind up shallowness in Jesus' name. We come against every care of this world and every worry that we're trying to choke out the word. And we come against the enemy that we're trying to steal the word as soon as it hit. But we ask you, Lord of the harvest, King of glory, to let the harvest flow in our lives and in our hearts in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody said amen. If you have your Bible, I'm going to read you a lot of verses. Not a lot, a lot. But then I'm going to teach what I teach, as much of it as I can. And um, a lot of times I read a lot of scripture that I may not get to touch, but it sets an understanding. And my understanding is that you're going to take these verses and you're going to go home and further whatever was taught and sit on them and and learn from them. That's the response of the mature. If you're here for the first time, and you heard that for the first time, now it's expected of you for the first time. (laughs) Esther chapter seven, and I'm gonna pick up exactly where I left off on midweek. Esther chapter seven says this, Verse 1 through 10, so the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, I want half. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. 
Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahasuerus, Artaxerxes, that's who that really is, answered and said to Queen Esther, who is he? I really want to try to pronounce that, but I don't want to. I feel like it'll, I feel like it'll kill the anointing if I sit here and sit on it. Answered and said unto Queen Esther, who is he and where is he? Who dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy. See, this is the thing, the adversary and the enemy wants to kill and annihilate and destroy her and her people. She said, if it was just about being slaves, that's one thing. I would have held my peace. I would have done my job. I would have done whatever I was told to do. But, but the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Bondage is just the first step. If you get settled in bondage, you're going to end up in destruction. He says, where is the adversary and enemy? Is this wicked, uh, she said, the adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther pleading for his life. See, when the king walks away, here comes the enemy trying to, trying to beg and get you in a corner and make a deal with you. Too many of us make deals with the enemy in a corner when God, when God gives you a pause. pleading for his life. He offered her everything. For he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace guard to the, to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? That's how much he threw himself at her begging. The enemy will throw you all type of things when he negotiating. As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. They caught him with a, uh, what's them, uh, burlap sack. Hey, SEAL Team 6 came in and <laughs> got him up right away. It says they, uh, they covered his, where am I at? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face, threw him in an astro van, and took off. <laughs> <laughs> it says, now Harbinah. One of the kings, one of the eunuchs said to the king, look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him on it. And so you have an understanding about that. When people think of gallows, they may be thinking of like uh, where, you, where you have hangmen. It's not what this was. If you go back a chapter when his wife told him to build this thing ahead of time, she convinced him, build this in place for Mordecai so it was ready for tomorrow so you can ask the king to, 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 to put him on it. It was a 50 cubit high pole that they were going to crucify him on. That word hang him on it is in the Hebrew also crucify him on it. They were going to impale him on this pole. It was not, he was not going to hang by the neck. He was going to be crucified. So they hanged Haman, or they crucified Haman, on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. Mark chapter 6, I'm going to read you eight verses out of there. Starting in verse 17, it says, For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared, feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him the king said to the girl ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you he also swore to her whatever you ask I will give you up to half my kingdom look at your other neighbor and say I want half so she went out and said to her mother what shall I ask he offered me half and she said the head of John the Baptist and she looked back and said that ain't quite half 
No, she didn't. <laughs> Said the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Scriptures say he had the execution to go and cut, execute him right there in the prison, chop his head off and bring it back on a platter and hand it to her in front of everybody. And she took it and gave it to her mother. That's wild. Half the kingdom, just the head of John the Baptist. You may be seated. We ended on midweek with this, um, with this story of Esther, and I talked about the, the misunderstanding or mispreaching often of called for such a time as this. Because we declare that all the time, you, you know, you are called for such a time as this. And, and we quote this scripture as if this is the time you are called for, but this is not what Mordecai said. And if you go back and you were to read in Esther chapter 4 when he says this, he says, Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows if this is why you are here? Uh, but either way, something got to be done. And if it ain't you, someone else is going to be raised up in your place to save Israel. But who knows if this is what you're supposed to do? Um, I made the point on midweek that escape is not our option. When Esther goes, well, if I perish, I perish. I'll do it. Escape is not our option, and hiding amongst the world is not our portion. We understand as believers that to live is Christ and to die is gain. So if I die, I die. That's what Thomas said when, when Jesus was going back to raise Lazarus. He said, let's go and die with him. That's the plan. You know what the plan is for every believer? Let's go and die with him. A scripture says we got to die to our flesh daily anyway, that we are living sacrifices. And if we have no intention to die with him, we have no intention to rise with him. For if we die, scripture says, in him, we raised up in him. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead gives life to our mortal body. And if a man wants to save his life, he must lose it. This is what Jesus taught. Let's go die with him. Too many people say they want to be with him, but don't want to die with him. You can't be with him without a cross. You can't be with him without a grave. You can't be with them without a resurrection Amen. because it's resurrection power. Yeah. Now, here's what we are offered. Here's what Esther is offered. Half the kingdom. Look at your neighbor again and say, I want half. How many of y'all want half? Francis says she want it all. The Lord said he won't share his glory with another, though. You, got, no, you can't have it all, Francis. You can't. She want all that belong to her, she said. She want, she want all that belong to her. She an heir. She a co-heir, though, so she only get a portion. She only get the, the equal portion that we all get. We all got a measure of faith. Uh, <laughs> but half, half is a general understanding of entitlement for a marriage. If you marry, half of it is yours. We are the bride. Half of it is ours. He says, what do you want? Do you want half, uh, ask me whatever you want, up to half the kingdom. Uh, this isn't a legitimate marriage. The problem is there are a lot of illegitimate marriages that happen uh, when, when you deal with the church today. The church is supposed to be the bride, but we know that there is a harlot. So there is a legitimate marriage that gets you half the kingdom and an illegitimate marriage that makes you want half the kingdom but are not entitled to it. In an illegitimate marriage, then, if you want half of it, you got to be conniving. You got to be cunning. You got to be subtle. You got to be maneuvering, which means you take on the image of the one that you really are made in the image of, which is the snake, the serpent. There's a hiss. You got to be more clever because you're stealing half as opposed to being given half because the marriage is illegitimate. Go before any court. Go before any judge. A marriage that is not legitimate, if there is not uh, uh, an understanding here that this was a covenant before God, or if you want to do it in front of the state, if it was not managed before the state, you are not entitled to half. Your living girlfriend don't get half. Uh, your baby mama don't get half. Um, that's why you don't be shacked up for, for, for five, six, seven years trying to yell common law in a state that don't got one. If you was good enough to bed for seven years, you was good enough to wed for seven years, the problem was you having no standard. 
Walk past many weddings for many beddings on the way and wonder why you're still single. When it rhyme, it work, huh? I, got, I, I, can, I can rhyme all day if we would. Shoot. Hey, drop the beat. No, just play. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> but illegitimate weddings, we get to see one in Mark chapter 6 as opposed to what happened in the book of Esther because uh, Herod took a wife for himself. So we already see the illegitimacy that he's walking in. We can go back to Genesis 6 and see that the sons of God saw that the, the daughters of men were beautiful and they went and took wives for themselves. These are illegitimate weddings, illegitimate marriages. And since these are the seed of the serpent, we see what comes from it. Herod chooses Herodias as his wife, but that's his brother's wife. This is why John is preaching against him. Your marriage is illegitimate. You married a harlot. But he offers then her daughter in negotiation half the kingdom. You already see the illegitimacy of the, of, the, of the negotiation because half will go to the wife, not the wife's daughter. So what happens here when he gives it to, to, her, her, to her daughter? The story says in the scriptures that she came in on his birthday and danced for him. What kind of dance do you dance? For half. <laughs> what kind of dance have a man go sign over the deed? This is a dance. A young girl comes in and his birthday and, and, and dances in such a way that he offers a half. I think that the question is, in your legitimate marriage or illegitimate marriage, whether you are of the bride of the harlot, you have to ask yourself who you dance for. Because David danced before the Lord. And his dance before God kept, keeps him in the marriage with God. Okay, he rejoiced before God. But a lot of us will dance before the enemy and not dance before God. Now, you might come in here in two-step. But your dance has to go further than here. You two-step for God and tap dance for the devil. Because you don't want to, you don't want to say nothing that's going to hurt nobody's feelings. You 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 are two step for God, but you dance wildly for the enemy, excited about every bribe and every everything that is offered, and and you will dance around the scriptures so that you don't have to please God, and then act like you dance into His beat when you come in His house. The question will be, who do I dance for? Is my dance for Him? Because. What we see with this young girl is that she is winning under false worship. So she thinks. I mean, when, when false worship offers you half a kingdom, then you dance well. A lot of people dance well for the enemy. She is, she is winning, though, under being molested. I don't know how YouTube's going to feel about this, but I don't care. This is a young girl, she's, she's, she's dancing before a party full of men, and she's winning under the idea of being molested. And this is how the harlotry spirit deals with us in the world, is that people think they win while they are assaulted and touched inappropriately by the world. While the world creeps into your secret places and puts its hands on things that don't belong to it, on, on, on things that are, are private and solely between you and God. This, this, this thing belongs to me and God only, and the world has its hands on it. Winning under, under being taken advantage of and, and told to keep it a secret because sin is a snare and told that it's, that it's your fault that you have been attacked and victimized so you can't mention it to nobody because you brought it on yourself so then no one confesses that sin one to another that they might be healed this young girl's winning under being molested in the harlot system she is winning under an exchange of headship because in order to win she's got to behead john the baptist so she's got to change from order to disorder she's got to change from from righteousness to unrighteousness but when we see esther come in and the king says who plots this problem she said it's the adversary and it's the enemy Haman I like when Jesus said the kingdom is likened unto a man who sowed good seed while he slept an enemy came and sowed bad seed and when it sprouted out the workers came to him and said did you not plant good seed and he said an enemy has done this 
This is Esther. She said, no, there's an enemy. An enemy has done this plan because the bride exposes the enemy. The bride don't cover the enemy. She, and she had an opportunity. When he fell across her lap and, and the king said, will he assault my wife in my own house with me here? That's because Esther had an opportunity to win with Haman under molestation. The king said, will you assault my wife? And this is, this is what happens is that, is that the enemy just don't attack you outside of the house of God. You know where he pleads with you? He pleads with you in the worship service. You got a pause. You got a distraction. And why so a negotiation began, a distraction began, something began to tell you you need to do this and do that and do this. And, and, and the Lord is standing there like, will the enemy assault my bride in my own house with me here? The bride exposes the enemy. Esther wasn't playing no games. Um, you know, it, it's wild because it wasn't until this moment that Haman knew who she was. Uh, she, she didn't deny who she was. She just didn't brag about who she was. You know, it's the same thing we see with Jesus when the enemy tempts him. The reason the enemy tempted him in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights was not because he knew he was tempting the Lord. It's because he had to find out if he was tempting the Lord. He had to find out if Jesus was him. Uh, that's why he comes at him with the temptation that deals with the priest, the prophet, and the king. Turn rocks to bread. That's a prophet's gift. Produce food for everybody. You see that with the prophets. You see the priest taking them to the highest place of a temple, saying, throw yourself down. And then you see him offer him kingdoms because the prophecy of the Messiah would be that he was priest, prophet, and king. So the enemy, to, if you are the son of God, do this. If so, and, and the enemy could not figure out, which is why when it came down to John the Baptist, they thought they had the one, which is why the discussion when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? They said, some say John the Baptist, some say this, some say that, because they weren't sure who the Christ was. They came to John and said, are you the one? He said, no, there's one coming after me. So, so, so the, and, and after John is beheaded, the reason this story takes place where we hear it is because Jesus is walking around doing miracles and people are telling Herod it's John the Baptist. And he said, it can't be. I beheaded him. And then we get the story of the beheading. So, so, so the enemy doesn't know right off who you are in God. He can't tell. Why do you think when Jehu is rushing over to kill Jezebel, the other kings and the sons of Jezebel said, is it peace? You can't tell by my aggression, it ain't peace. You can't tell by my movement, it ain't peace. But to a negotiator, peace is always on the table up until the last minute. He can bribe you to the last minute. Why do you think Haman never gave up? So... You know, she didn't deny who she was, but she just didn't talk about it. You know, when you, when you walk into a place sometimes, you're not denying uh, your identity. Knowing, but them not knowing who you are might get you in a door easier. You got bouncers, spiritual bouncers at the doors of the places that God has called you to, trying to keep you out. When Daniel prayed, there was, a, there was an angel that, that fought the angel that came to do the answering. He said, I heard you on the first day, but I got held up by the prince of tear. I had to call Michael, the archangel, to come and contend with him so I can get to you. Because there are bouncers that stand at the door, strong men armed to the teeth that think they own the house. And you know what? Sometimes you can get in and out of a place if they don't know who you are. So there are times where God will insulate you and God will, 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 will keep you quiet for a season. But, but it's not denying who you are because let's be real. Your presence speaks louder than your mouth every day of the week. The fact that Esther had been in the oil spoke louder than her walking in saying, I'm called of God more than anything. When she stepped in, the king couldn't say nothing else. He knew she was the one. And you've been soaked in the oil. Now, this message, this particular point, don't go to you if you ain't soaked in the oil. Because you walk in acting like you ain't something, and then get in trying to pretend like you was something, but wasn't no oil on it, you wasn't never nothing. You was exactly who you act like you wasn't the first time coming around. <laughs> and, and, and the reason, the reason the Lord will let his anointing speak sometime before he lets you speak is so that he can get you into a place. 
because you will talk yourself out of places that he will anoint you into. And the importance of it is that bombs do more damage on the inside. Bombs do more damage on the inside. If it blows up on the outside of a thing, it may do exterior damage. But if it blows up on the inside of a thing, it's going to destroy a lot of the things that need to, that's trying to hold up. This is one of the reasons why, why the Holy Spirit coming on you is greater than the Holy Spirit, or is less than the Holy Spirit being in you. Uh, in the Old Testament, we got to see the Holy Spirit come on people, it came on Samson, came on David. The New Testament believer gets the Holy Ghost to come in him because how much more change happens when the Holy Ghost is in you than on you? He can do much more in you than on you. The New Testament believer should be inspired by the Old Testament but not outworked by it. I should look at Samson and say, man... That's awesome to be able to do with God. But I should not be like, Samson can do more than me. I should be able to outwork him because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. He visited Samson. He dwells in me. That's why Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do. Yet we live in a day where no greater thing than any of these are ever done. We don't find a greater faith. We don't find a greater discipline. We don't find a greater love. We don't find a greater mercy. We don't find a greater anything in the bride of Christ. The scriptures say that God didn't give us a spirit of fear. But the spirit he gave us is one of power. The word power in the Greek is dunamis or dynamite or explosive because he does more inside. And then what happens is he overflows up out of you, and, and he changes you within by being in, but he overflows out of you and then changes those things that are outside of us. Just know this. If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, even if you got in quietly, you can't keep quiet forever. Even if God moved you in without you being able to speak on it, eventually you got to step up because you can't keep quiet forever. And the real question is, are you willing to risk your comfort for, the, for salvation to expand? If it costs me my job, now I ain't telling you to go in there and get fired tomorrow. <laughs> the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. I ain't telling you go slap your boss with a Bible in the face. I ain't telling you that. I'm telling you, though, there is a time, and who knows if there was a time that you will be called. And, and, and what happens is uh, when it's time to stand on the scriptures, to stand on the call, is it okay for you to lose the comforts that you have enjoyed for so long? There's nothing wrong with comfort as long as you don't find peace in your comfort. Because then you could take that thing that made me comfortable, but you can't take my peace. And I could sleep on the floor as peaceful as I could sleep on a bed. And I'll find my comfort in him. Are we willing to lose our comfort, our reputation, or whatever to expand salvation? And understand this, that if you have no plans to establish the kingdom where you are, God did not bring you there. If you are in a place that you have zero plans to expand the kingdom there, God didn't bring you there. I don't understand. I don't care. I think Patrick sent me a DM the other day about some Christian artist or something talking about how they be in the club with the Bible. <laughs> he asked me what I thought. I, I thought he didn't need to message me for that. I think it's obvious what I think about it. I think it's a... The stupidest thing in the world. He's in a place where you are not going to expand the kingdom. God did not take you there. He didn't. Jesus never went to the club. He didn't. I don't care how they painted. He was with sinners. Now, sinners are at the grocery store. Well, he was at the bar. Was it a bar, though? I like to see the scriptures. Maybe a tavern. Maybe it was Chili's. Maybe it was Friday's. Perhaps Applebee's. Definitely not a dive bar with a dartboard and like, yeah, let's go in here with the bandits. It was a different culture. Stop trying to paint the ancient days into South Beach. 
There's only so many places you could go to eat or drink. They didn't have restaurants all over every corner, watering holes everywhere. There's only so many places that you can go. They said, oh, you going over there with the sinners. Well, there's only, there's only one or two places in town I can go, y'all and both of them. <laughs> but if you, have a, if, if, if you have no intention to expand, expand the kingdom where you are, God didn't bring you there. You just went there. In fact, you went there to hide. And, and, and the reality of it is we have to then understand that it doesn't even matter what you produce in that place. Because results don't equal fruit. And this is where the modern day harlotry of the church and its leadership, coaching, and motivation has failed the believers. Uh, it hasn't failed its members. It has failed the believers. And this is the problem, is that the harlot can have her members and they can be successful, but success don't equal fruit. Fruit is fruit. And success in this world is success in this world. Fruit is fruit. And results in this world are results in this world. Fruit is of the Holy Spirit. Uh, these are the fruit of the Spirit. And since he's the Lord of the harvest, you can water and you can plant, but he adds the increase. And there is a difference in fruit and success. And when we start calling our paychecks fruit, we are foolish. Members will be happy and believers will be stranded because there will be many believers that didn't have the advantages that these members had. And when, you, and when you go away from being a believer into being a member, then you can figure out, you can't figure out whether the word of God applies to you or if you are in sin because you're not as successful as somebody else because you have moved the things of God into a system of the world. And someone has told you that when God is happy with you, he gives you things. The fruit is of the spirit. And the Lord increases the harvest, not the harvest of your things, the harvest of the fruit of his kingdom, the fruit of his spirit. You know what should happen as you grow in him? Your peace should expand. But if you get more things and then get more worried about losing more things, you got things and not peace. Um, your joy should expand. Your self-discipline should expand. Your patience should expand. All of these things should expand. And then those who come to the kingdom through the fruit you have produced, because they tasted and seen that the Lord was good, that should expand. You know, scriptures say we're going to know them by their fruit. You know what it don't say? You're going to know them by their success. But that ain't what we teach today. They say you're going to know them by their fruit. They don't say you're going to know them by their results in the workplace. Know them by their results in, in meeting deadlines. You gonna, it didn't say you're going to know them by their pay grade. Come on. Come on. Good. And that's why you winning is not the same thing as you righteous. Amen. Because you can win in this world and go to hell. Because you can win in this world and be far from God. You can win in this world on the backs and the shoulders and the necks of other people you walked on and had to betray in order to win. Because when you deal with winning, you deal with competition. When you deal with competition, you deal with opposition. When you think they're opposition, you treat them as enemies. And you never love your brother as you love yourself. You don't think one football player on one team is going to help block for the guy on the other team, right? But that's what he would want. And that's what the kingdom has turned into, is a, is a competition where we care more about winning than we care about being righteous. And we have to understand then that having things is not proof that God is in your life. Because you can have a lot of things and be missing one thing. And this is what Jesus taught the rich ruler is you lack one thing. You got many things. Martha, you worried about many things. But she chose the good thing. It don't matter. All the things you have have never been a qualification for God being in your life. Somebody say, I want half. That seemed counterproductive, huh? It's amazing because when you look at marriages, it's so different today in 2024 than it was in 2004. And it was different in 2004 than it was in 1984. And it was different in 1984 than it was in 1954. Uh, old couples, old couples, 
my grandparents uh, were married for 45, 50 years. They didn't have a lot of things, but they had each other. And they stayed together. And they were together for the, their entire lifetime. My grandfather passed, and my grandmother, she ain't moved on. I mean, she's living. Ain't, no, ain't nobody else coming up in their eyes because we have to knock that old dude out. <laughs> Break his hip. <laughs> Until death do your part, and then some. <laughs> this guy gonna need a life alert. <laughs> Falling and I can't get up. <laughs> But they, ain't have, they didn't have a lot of stuff, but they was together for a lifetime. Today's couples, man, they got many things. And they can't stay together through a thunderstorm. It got too loud outside, I got to move out. But they got all the stuff. And the old couples, they had none of the stuff, but had it lifetime together. And if we were to look at the, de the degrading of marriage, we could say, you know what? There was a day where being with God was not dependent on what stuff I had. And you know what? You couldn't tear me from his presence. You couldn't yank me off his lap. You couldn't get me out of a prayer closet. I had no problem if we was in an usher meeting on Monday, a prayer meeting on Tuesday, a Bible study on Wednesday, choir rehearsal on Thursday, youth ministry on Friday. On Saturday, we was cleaning the church up. On Sunday, we was there at 8 a.m. for Sunday school, 10 a.m. for church, 6 p.m. for evening service. And we let the world come in and mock us and say, you spend all that time and money at the church and look at your life now. Let us look back at them and say, you spend all your time where you want to be and look at your life. You don't spend no time and money at the church and you are falling apart, miserable. We ain't never heard so much talk about mental health and self-care. You mean to tell me when you remove Jesus from the picture, your mind fall apart, I understand. You mean to tell me when you remove Jesus from the picture, you gotta take extra time to take care of yourself outside of your selfishness, I understand. Because the kingdom does a service. It brings youth and restores strength to your body and gives peace to your mind and your heart so now look at you don't spend a dollar at the church don't spend a minute at the church and your wife hates you and your girlfriend hates you too and both of them pregnant two weeks apart and ain't neither one of them yours <laughs> we can keep going I can keep going can't stand a thunderstorm and the churches didn't have to change we had to change because we have stopped being focused on the fruit of God which is only produced by the Spirit of God you understand you can't produce fruit I can't produce fruit nothing we do produces fruit I can plant that's it I can water that's it but all increase comes to him if it don't come from him what happens is when I plant and I water I end up with a fig tree with leaves and no fruit and that is cursed. So what happens now is we understand that we, then if there's no fruit and we're doing it with membership and we're doing it with what we can do and we've turned it into something else, well, then it takes a different uh, agenda. The harlot takes a different process than the bride. The bride will call everyone and tell her, look at my ring. The bride will call everyone, I'm getting married. The harlot got to work a different plan. Her calls don't matter because harlots don't have friends. Who are they going to call? So, there's something going on in the front row. If you're watching online, I don't know what's happening, but they, got, they, they know what the harlot doing. They say, yeah, that's right, that's right. She ain't got no friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so what happens then is the church goes from discipleship and, and us growing the kingdom accordingly as the bride to we have to go to a marketing plan. Marketing church markets itself. <laughs> you know what Jesus never said? Go into all the world and boost these posts. <laughs> he never said it. He never said, go into the world and make billboards. Go into the world and send out flyers. Go into the world. Never said it. 
That's it. Go into the world and, and hire the newspapers and ask and allow uh, Zuckerberg and allow um, Meta and all these people to be in charge of whether or not people see what you have to say about me. Because it is an algorithm. And you can pay for it and they can bury you into the pages of other Christians who don't need to hear it from you at all. So then you guess what you don't get to make? Disciples. You just get to bury it amongst those who already like you. And Jesus never told us to go do that. He didn't say, go out there and finance the advertising of what I'm saying. He, he said, go and tell them. Go and tell them to do all that I have commanded you. you, you know, and I don't mind invite cars, and we used to have them, but I stopped getting them a long time ago because I said, we are not going to excuse you, your responsibility to be a human to somebody. And you just walk up and hand him a card and walk on like, what is that card going to do? He, and there's no problem with it, but he didn't say go out there and hand out cards. Right. He said go and tell them. Right. He didn't say go online and sneak this. He didn't say go online and share memes and hope they get it. He didn't say go online and post your best Christian content. Find your best 30-second preacher of a preach. They don't care about that. Go tell them. Yeah. That means go look them in the eye. Yeah. Go have a relationship. Get out from behind your phone. Get out from behind your hand. Get out from behind your wall. Walk out there in the gas station, and if you're going to pay at the pump, talk to the guy on the other side of the pump. If you ain't going to do that, walk inside, pay inside, talk to the clerk. Hold the door open for somebody and tell them the Lord loves them. Go and tell them. That's just an opening. That ain't the, that ain't the gospel. That's the opening. When they say thank you, say, oh, by the way. <laughs> oh, I didn't hold this door open for nothing. If you stop and listen, or you go back outside and you pull the door shut. Pull it, say, man, lock it, and you can't come in here. Now you ain't got no gas. Now ain't nobody going nowhere. Now what we talking about? <laughs> because there's a kingdom at stake. There's a kingdom at stake. Uh, we're, offered, we're offered half of it if we are in, in, in the legitimacy, and the enemy offers us a kingdom too if it is illegitimate. Listen, listen, let, let me jump to someone else who was offered a kingdom. David, 1 Samuel 17. David, he's walking his cheese and bread up to his brothers. And, and when he gets there, you I know the story. Goliath is out there 40 days, 40 nights, calling out, send me a champion. If I defeat them, you'll be my servants or slaves. If, if y'all beat me, then we'll be your slaves. Right? We understand this. We, we understand that these are Canaanites, now known as Phoenicians. And, 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 and now they stand in Judah. Y'all know, and just for, 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 for context, um, that they went from being the people of Phoenicia to being the people of Venetia. Hence, if you go to Vegas, the Hotel the Venetian or those of Venice, these are Canaanites. Okay, this is how the people developed. All right, so that when you read through history, not so that you go over to Venice right now, I'm like, you're a Canaanite. <laughs> you know? But when you read through history and you see these talks of wars and different things like that or different uh, warfare that happened, you understand the context or why these people serve these gods in this way is that this is how this goes down anyway. These Philistines are Phoenicians. They come from across the water. They are, they are warrior priests. They, are, they serve Dagon. Okay? And so David shows up on the scene and this is going on and, 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 and David hears it and, and he says, what's the man get? that fights this man, that takes this deal? What do I get if I stand for something? What do I get if I expand salvation? What do I get, what's the negotiation here? And they said, well, whoever does this, the king's gonna enrich him with great riches. You get to marry the king's daughter and his father's house is tax free. Oh, so I get a kingdom. I get to marry a princess, I'm anointed king. And I, I become rich and my house is tax free, which makes me another nation. I get a kingdom. Okay, I'm going to take the fight. Because you don't know it, but I've been anointed to be king, which means the princess is mine, which means I need a kingdom, and this makes sense for me. So he gets into this fight, and then here, here, here comes his brother. Now his brother was passed over from being anointed to be king, Eliab. And now he want to pass over David, who got the anointing to be king, from him getting a kingdom. He steps up and says, uh, uh, where them few sheep you keep, little, little David? 
you know, your little baby boy, or you're your little poetry book. Where are your flute, little David? I know you come to see your battle. I know you're proud. And uh, David asked a question that I think we have stopped asking in 2024. Is there not a cause? It don't matter, Eliab, what you say. There is a cause. And whether or not I survive this thing, there is a cause. And the cause is worth laying my life down for. God is God. Yahweh is God. And there's no way we're going to let this uncircumcised Philistine speak against the things of God in the place of God that has been promised by God. There is a cause to die for. And we live our life today without a cause. And, and we have let people convince us that we have some individual purpose that we are supposed to know and chase after and get click funnels for and a marketing plan and run people because being an entrepreneur is everybody's dream now. Y'all know 90% of entrepreneurs are broke. <laughs> broke. <laughs> you know who don't get paid in the business? The owner. All my business owners said amen. They don't pay themselves. If a bill got to get paid, they, who get, they pay cut first? The owner. If somebody got to work late, guess who's working late? The owner. <laughs> you know who's going to lose friends and family? The owner. You know why? Because they don't support the business of the owner. Yo, y'all going to go down there and get y'all thing done and I'm right here? Now, an employee don't care where you go. They ain't got no discount to give you. We think that we have been convinced of our purpose in the earth when the scripture says that God's purpose has prevailed, that, that all things work together for his purpose, right? Not, not your purpose, his purpose. And David asks, is there not a cause? And I love this because Mordecai says to Esther, could it be that you have been called for such a time as this? This throws into a perspective for me. Where, where, where it knocks down the idea that we have to be certain about what God has called us to do. Like, I don't have to be certain about the steps he has ordered me in. In fact, the only thing I'm certain of is taking the next step. The word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I'm going to take the next step. This is ordered. If I fall in that step, I fall into his hand that sustains me. I'm not utterly cast down. Now, the only time I come off of this with my viewpoint to this is when I'm looking to the hills from which cometh my help. Is when I'm looking towards the kingdom. But you know what? I, then I'm back to the next step. We want to know exactly before we do anything what we're supposed to do before we do anything and the question then becomes can you identify the cause of God not the cause of you and when you walk into a place could it be that you have been called for this I don't know and the question is is there a cause here or should I just drop these sandwiches off and go and a lot of us jump into fights that have no cause and walk away from causes without a fight. And the reality that I settle myself in uh, is that if it's God's call, or excuse me, if it's God's cause, it's God's call. I can walk into something, I have no knowledge of it, but I recognize that this is a God cause, and that makes it my call right now. If this is from God, then it's for me to do. If God wants it done, then I'm going to do it. And you could talk about the sheep I keep, and you could talk about my pride, and you could talk about me only coming to see a battle, and you could tell me I'm too young to fight it, but I see a cause no one else is going to step into if I don't step into it. When we get into this fighting God's cause, we get an issue. Immediately, they bring David to Saul. Y'all know the story. Saul says, where are my armor? Y'all know Saul was a tall man, yeah. the tallest in all of Israel, the scriptures say. He was like seven foot two, somewhere around there. I mean, he was a, he was a pretty big man himself. So when Goliath steps on the scene, it only makes sense if they have a champion, that is Saul. 
Saul ain't no sucker. Saul, big boy. Why do you think they voted for him? Oh, man, he walked in and commanded the room. Saul and Jonathan had the only two swords in all of Israel. Only armor. All them Philistines had it, but only Saul and Jonathan, which is why when David steps up, Saul's like, here, wear my armor. And he puts his armor on David because David ain't got no armor. Uh, this is not valiant. Saul is not looking out for David. Be careful of people who don't understand the cause of God. That try to dress you for the war of God. That's why you can't let everybody on your timeline have something to say about what you got going on. You can't let everybody in your family advise you on the things of God. Because if they don't understand the cause of God, they won't understand the warfare that you are stepping into. And they don't really have, look, look Saul gives him as he dresses him. But it wasn't for David's benefit. It was for Saul's benefit. Now Saul got one more day that he can be king. And perhaps if David goes out there dressed like Saul and wins, they will say Saul slayed his ten thousands. But if David goes out there dressed like Saul and loses, the, Phil the, 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 the Philistines will think we've killed their king and, and retreat. It was, it was a mess. It was a disaster. And, and David, he's like, um, I'm not wearing that. You got to stop wearing other people's armor. Uh, because other people's armor attract other people's enemies. And this is, this is a, a problem. Because when that king stands in the crowd, every enemy goes after the king. The war is over once the king is dead. And a lot of times we jump into everyone else's fight. Trying to do, be, be wearing everyone else's thing. Trying to do it the way they did it. Hey, you should try this. This works. Do this. This works. No, that worked for you. God's armor is God's oil. Ask Esther about it. She walked into opposition where she could be killed for just walking in the room, but the oil was on her. Y'all know, y'all do know garments carry anointings, right? Like, and this is not, this is not uh, 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 some, some goofy teaching or some weird mystical teaching, but, but, but there's a reason why in 1 Samuel 17, 38, 39, David rejected Saul's armor. It wasn't tried. It ain't been in no battle. It ain't, it ain't been, I ain't fought in this, moved in it, walked in it. It ain't took no shots. You sitting here with this shiny armor up in your tent, directing everybody. This right here, he rejected that because he was a fighter. And you don't put a fighter in untried armor. Right, right. Killed a lion. Killed a bear. Never needed your armor then. Why I'm going to get here and change who was my defense? Why I'm going to get here and change from the oil to the armor? I don't understand. I have an armor. I have a breastplate of righteousness. I have a helmet of salvation. I'm going with my, my, my loins are going with, the, with the, the truth and feet shod with the gospel of peace. I don't need what you are offering. Your health care don't... Arm and protect my body, the Holy Ghost do. Your pay don't protect my legacy, the Holy Ghost do. So I can't be but, and, and, and I'm here to do what God has caused me to do. But, in 1 Samuel 18, just a chapter later, around verse 4, Jonathan offers David his clothes, and he accepts them. He rejects Saul's. And he accepts Jonathan's. Because clothing carries an anointing. Garments carry an anointing. And there's a reason why when Elijah walks past Elisha, he throws his mantle on him. When he comes in contact with the mantle, he says, I got to follow you. The woman with the issue of blood said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. They took handkerchiefs out of the clothing of the apostles and sent them out for people to be healed. Now, understand this. If you are up at 2 o'clock in the morning... And you turn the TV on, and there's a telemercial on, uh, infomercial, and they're like sending you blessed money oil and cut up prayer cloths for prophecy you call in and you donate. Don't do it. Don't do it. You, you got just, I mean, you just, all you did was call Cleo the psychic. Don't do it. Don't do it. But, but, but I also, also want to show you the spiritual significance of this because you know one thing that we do in this culture without thinking about it? is we, we go and we, we'll exchange clothes with each other. Oh, you ain't got nothing to wear? I got a dress you can wear. 
Oh, you ain't got nothing to wear? Here, here, take this. Or we live in hand-me-downs. And you'll wash them before you wear them, but do you pray over them before you wear them? Because somebody was in those garments, and they were who they were, and were where they were, with who they were with, and then passed that on into your house. Now, there's a reason why Tamar didn't go to trick Judah in her widow's clothes. And she had to cover her face and put on the garments of a harlot. But when she went back to being a widow, she took off the harlot's garments. There's a reason why when Lazarus came out the grave, Jesus said, take those dead clothes off of them. There's a reason why at the banquet, the owner of the banquet walks up to those called and said, why did you come here dressed like that? We... We wear other people's things. We, we, uh, our children, our young daughters will take boys' hats at the school and put it on and wear it because they think they're cute. But you just took headship from them and put it on you and yielded yourself to their opinion because you thought they was cute. And wonder why suddenly your father's voice is distant from you and you don't think that he know what he's talking about no more. It's because there's a shift in headship because there is something that happens in the garments. He rejects Saul's garments. I love the way Jesus works his way through the scripture and, and, and puts things in order and back together again. Get this. Saul, we don't need your armor. Jonathan will accept what you passed down because you were the prince until the, the anointed one came on. And then you handed over your princely garments because there's one that's anointed to be king greater than you. Then we jump hundreds of years and, and here goes John the Baptist, baptizing in the Jordan, saying, I have to decrease so that he can increase, that they will come into him for repentance. And he said, but there's one coming after me. I, of all the prophets, Jesus said, from the, from the Old Testament till now, there's none greater than John the Baptist, but I have to decrease. Because there's one coming after me whose sandals I can't even lace. The garments he's wearing, I can't even touch them. And so what happens is now this John, just like that John, passes on to the son of David. With that John passed on to David, which is here comes the king. But there was a soul there who was still collecting garments. Read the book of Acts. When Stephen was stoned, guess who was there? The young boy saw, and they were throwing their garments at his feet, anointing him to be their high priest, going after slaying all of the Christians, putting him in the same way they threw garments before Jesus, screaming, Hosanna, save now. They threw the garments of the apostles at the feet of Saul, saying, go ahead, and, and you are anointed to go kill them. But, and we know then by that, he was elected too, just like Saul was elected. But here comes Jesus on the road to Damascus. He didn't take, David didn't take Saul's, he took Jonathan's. Jesus takes the hand off from John and then goes and puts Saul in his place. Now we're going to call you Paul because we're going to redeem it all. That, that Saul tried to kill David. This Saul is going to lift up the son of David. And there's a kingdom that comes from it from doing it God's way. The kingdom is attached to the marriage, though. Um, we, see, we see the marriage between Herodias and Herod, and there's a headship there that comes off, and something in the way of their falsehood, and it was John. They had to remove spiritual headship in order to operate in their wrong marriage. The, the things that came out the harlot's marriage was seduction, right? As a young girl dancing. Uh, perversion, right? There was a young girl dancing. Yeah. Lust, right? Yeah. There was a young girl dancing. <laughs> oh, she's just over there doing her thing. Uh, and there was the worship that was going on because there was a young girl dancing. And then we see, the, the, and he offered her half the kingdom. And then we see David being offered his kingdom. David marries Micah. What's in the way of David and Micah, though, is Goliath. Now, what comes out of David stepping into his place is an anointing. Uh, freedom for all the people and praise. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of angel armies. And this flows out of a proper, uh, a somewhat proper marriage. And then you have Esther and Xerxes. And in the way of what they are doing, you have Haman. Just understand there will always be opposition. 
If you are serving God, there will be opposition from the enemy trying to break up the marriage. If you are serving the enemy, God always makes a way of escape so that he can break up your lie. Uh, Esther and Xerxes, they have Haman, and, and, and Esther's whole thing is about preserving a people over preserving a status versus Herodias, who was trying to preserve her status uh, over preserving a people. She, had, she, 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 she served herself over people. This is, she, she has a capitalism mentality. It's about me, not the people. And so in order to maintain her capitalism, she had to decapitate John. She had to take the headship off. And then they're offered half the kingdom. Look at your neighbor again and say, I want half. Now, this is not really, let me just say that I'm sure Herod didn't mean I'm going to give you half. <laughs> the devil don't never mean he's going to give you what he told you. Let's start there, right? <laughs> he never meant you could have half. And, 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 and even with, with Xerxes, because Xerxes was not a, a believer in Jehovah God. He was a Persian, uh, and, and they had their own gods and things like that, that he probably did not mean to Esther, you can have half either. Um, what it was probably more generally speaking of is make any request that you can make, whatever it is, I'm going to grant it, and it could be big, right? This is what we see in the scriptures, though, in a, in a proper marriage. Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, it will not be held back from you. Because of who you are to me and who I am to you, whatever you ask in my name, it won't be held back. It ain't got to be small. You ain't got to beg for the crumbs that fall from the master's table. There's a table prepared before you. You are pulled up to it. Your cup runs over. Your head's anointed with oil. And so now whatever you ask in my name. And, and the reason that both of them got it, whether in the harlot or in the bride, was because they pleased the blesser. That's why you know it's a cost for people who don't serve God, is they have to please their blesser. We are living sacrifices for the king of kings, and they have to present sacrifices for their lesser king, for their Molech. They have to, which means king, right? They have to produce a lesser sacrifice. So they don't just get to succeed there without death reigning. You know, the word damsel, there in Mark chapter 6 where it says she came out dancing, just a young damsel, this and that. The word salome, I mean, salami, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's, uh, <laughs> Do it again. Y'all heard it. This is this word. It means in the Greek, it means uh, a young girl. Somebody say young girl. Young girl. Uh, the only other places used, not the only other place, one of the main places used in scripture is Matthew chapter nine, where Jairus goes to get Jesus for his daughter. And that word is used when he says, little girl, get up. That little girl was 12 years old. Because it's only used of a young maid. Which means this damsel that was dancing before Herod and his birthday party of men and perverts was approximately 12 years old. And, and unless we teach this thing properly, we will think it's a conspiracy theory every time we talk about human trafficking. We will think that, that molestation and assault and these things that happen, happen in some small minority of the minds of people in a corrupt corner of darkness in the earth versus understanding that it is the culture of the kingdom of the enemy to sacrifice and hurt and injure the innocent. It is the culture. Your favorite actor is one of them. Your favorite singer is one of them. Your favorite movie was financed on the back of many of them. Your favorite sports player is not talented enough. They are one of them. You do not go platinum without one of them. Hear it clearly. You don't get 20 million for a movie unless you deal in one of them. It is, it is, it is not the way. You don't, you don't become some 
super trending person on TikTok and, and, and on Instagram without being approached to become one of them. And if you deny it, you'll go back into the algorithm like everyone else. Now, this is hard because they have lied in their false system and, and bribed when the king was, was, was seemed distant, bribed the bride saying, hey, if you work hard, you can be anything. Hey, I can make sure you get this. I can offer you a kingdom for your worship. If you come over here, your kids can be this. They can be this. They can be this. If you put them in school and they get higher education, we guarantee them this much money. Oh, keep them in your schools. For how many more years? School. Isn't that Latin for scola? Scola is the Latin word we get school from. Isn't that mean um, to be in a sect, a follower, a disciple of? Isn't that why they call it when you get kicked out of that school, you have been expelled? You've been taken out of the spell? No, in order to be there, you got to be one of them. My wife said, they don't want that truth in this university. (laughs) Which is funny that they call it a university. (laughs) Universe? Great architect of the universe? That's Masonic. Um, Architect in the Greek, architecton, principality. Uh, Mason of God, builder of God, Gadarel. That's the floating G. Right? Uh, We could walk this thing out. This universe, God didn't create the universe. He created the heavens and the earth. And told us to cast down imaginations. All right, we can walk that out on another day. That's not the message today. You can't get half of a universe. (laughs) Half of nothing is nothing. All right, all right, back to the point. Uh, 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 so what happens now is, 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 is this young girl in this indoctrination because she has a teacher. And, and she's under a spell when she puts people under a spell. And, and, and here's what she requested, death. You understand every request from the enemy is death, no matter how they dress it. It's like weekend at Bernie's. You could put death in the car with you and have it wave at everybody, it's still death. <laughs> You, you can take it to the drive-in. It's still death. Uh, it's death, and, and she requests death versus Esther, who requests salvation. And this is the difference. Is do you, the, Salvation is salvation. Salvation is not me pretending like we're going to set you free. Salvation is not uh, some, some promise to set you free. Salvation is salvation, not delayed freedom. She requested death. And one parent has, uh, is seeking God to lead their child out of death. Jairus comes to Jesus and says, my daughter is sick and dying. I need you to come. One parent is, is at the feet of Jesus. One parent said, come into my house. My daughter needs you. If you don't come, we ain't going to make it. She's a damsel. And, and, and there's a perversion that wants to eat away at her and take her life. And there's another parent on the other side that's leading a child to choose death. You could be anything you want to be. Oh, yeah, you're six years old. Here's Instagram and we'll make you popular and and this and that. And you, like, choose death, not knowing that the result of choosing the death will silence the voice of God in their life. The minute she chose it, John had no more say with Herod. And if you knew that your primping and prodding into an area of success in the world was primping and prodding them further away from the word of God, that their ears were becoming deafer and their eyes were becoming blinder, and the minute that they couldn't hear him no more, they can't hear you no more. Because you are the closest thing in the earth to represent godly authority in their life, whether you sin or not. Which is why people will push their parents away to push God away. This is why wives or husbands will push their spouse away to push God away. Has nothing to do with the flesh. Has everything to do with the spirit. If you started hating God, they'd start loving you. It's your standard that pushes away. 
This is why I don't believe in or buy into the idea that you get to choose if you come into church. Long as you live at this address, you're going to be at this address. And you might have went through puberty and feel like you're a woman now. Well, I'm going to drag you into church bleeding and stinking. You might feel like you're a man because you got a little hair on your chest. I'm going to knock the bass so far down your throat it come out as a fart. Excuse me. Burp. You going to come to this address. And when you can whoop me, you're still coming to this address. Because you, cause you whooping me mean you could whoop the mortgage. So unless you could whoop me, the mortgage, FPL, Publix, oh, we gang banging for Jesus. <laughs> That's a fact. Because I know the moment. I encourage you to walk away and do your thing. So that, here, let me, here, let me help parents. Let me help the deception that happens. Y'all good? Because I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I promise I'm almost done with my introduction. Listen. <laughs> I'm about to help every parent in here. Here's the lie of Haman in your ear. Here's the enemy, the adversary when the king is walking through his garden. And, and it's, it's amazing the relevance of, of how this happened is that God, the voice of God was walking on the wind in the cool of the day through the garden. And it's at this point that Eve and Adam are hiding with the serpent. This is where the assault takes place while the king is in the garden. Here's the whisper that lies to the parent. If you don't want to lose them, you better let them do what they want. And so parents encourage their children to do it their way because I don't want you to hate me the way you hate God. I don't want you to hate me the way you hate going to church. No, all you did was bow down to them. Here's the issue with your worship to them is when your worship no longer lives up to their idolatry of their self, they do away with you and find another worshiper. So all you are really doing is setting yourself up to bow down to them until they no longer need your adoration. Which is why when they become of age, they leave you anyway. And I would rather they leave me angry, but can't get away from the training I put in them. That there is an eternal call from the altars of God. Then, they, then I help sever the umbilical cord, the umbilical cord, and then they left me too. Whoop them till they grown, then whoop them till they gone. Because one parent thought that they could use a kindness, a pleasantry to say, hey, here's how you can get a kingdom. But it's going to silence God. And no matter how pleasant it seemed, the guiding of a parent caused them to miss the voice of God. Um, when Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, there's a kingdom on the back end of it. Uh, he says, ask, seek, and knock. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. If you ask, it'll be answered to you. If you seek, you're going to find it. If you knock, the door will be as open unto you. Which of you, if your son was hungry, asked you for bread, you would give him a stone. If he asked you for a fish, would you give him a serpent? If you, being evil men, know how to give good gifts, how much more your father in heaven? How much more if you asked him for the Holy Spirit? Would he not give it? Now, this, this is an introduction to the marriage. This is what he's saying. If you ask for his hand in marriage, ask for the Holy Ghost, because unless a man be born again of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. Unless he be born again of water and of spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, since there is a kingdom attached to the marriage, you have to ask. Ask for the Holy Ghost to give. Seek. Seek him with your whole heart, it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, and I'll be found by you not and it'll be opened unto you. This, this right here is, is, is access to the marriage. And, and what happens then is, is once we enter the kingdom, we understand how we get it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. You know, there's a pursuant that happens. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. But at the same time, I'm seeking the kingdom and the righteousness. His kingdom is coming. 
We are meeting on the road. Say prove it, pa say prove it, Pastor. <laughs> Scriptures say that there was a, a bad child, prodigal son, and he wanted his inheritance up front. That's all of us before we know Jesus. I want mine now, right? He took it, he spent it wildly, did whatever, and then feeding the pigs, came to himself, said, my father's house. Servants got better. He gets up and he starts walking back to the father's house. The father sees him afar off, and he doesn't stay there and say, I'm going to let you walk this whole thing out. He gets up off the porch and runs down to meet him, just like Jesus came to meet us in the flesh. The kingdom met the, met the asking, the, the seeking, met the seeker. Because God's not running from us, we're running from him. So whenever we change directions and run to him, he's already in pursuit. Let's talk about the cross for a minute since we got to Jesus. Mordecai has this cross built this pole built in order to impale Mordecai on. And uh, let me get some keys up here. So what we see in this book of Esther I always tell you how, how I study, I, I say, where is Jesus? So I'm looking for Jesus in everything that I read. Mordecai is now destined for a cross, a pole to be crucified on. Haman, though, is, is put in exchange for Mordecai on this pole for his life. In the same fashion that Jesus did, for us, that this adversary, though, was killed and took his own blame there as opposed to him trying to crucify called people. And it's shown there. But when Jesus comes on the scene, he does it differently. He doesn't say, you take what you owe. He says, I'll take what you owe. And in this one, an innocent man gets put onto the cross for all the people. When you, when you, when you look at how this world celebrates the villain, you can look at Michelangelo's uh, painting of the Sistine Chapel. Anybody ever looked at it? You know that the villain of Purim is in the Sistine Chapel, which is Haman. Haman is in the painting being crucified as the villain of Purim. And they exalt him, and he is exalted forever in this, in this ceiling of this chapel being crucified. It, it, it's, it's amazing, like I said, how Jesus will undo a thing as you walk through it in the scriptures, how, how, how Haman may have been put on there by this king, but you know what? All that did was save the people temporarily. But something has to be put on the cross to save the people eternally and to Jesus. And I think it's amazing historically that Haman was crucified in, in the Hebrew month of not, not, come on, Nassim? Am I saying it right? <laughs> Nissan <laughs> like the car <laughs> I said it Nassim I got the letters backwards the devil is a lie <laughs> Haman was crucified in the Hebrew month of Nissan uh, which is um, Passover time right let me just say let me just say for the sake of those in the room we believe in the, the feast of, of God and not pagan holidays there's a big difference. Now, in order to not lose the ability to reach as many as possible for the sake, when Paul said, I become all things to all people, so I might reach one, we will celebrate and honor Passover and resurrection on the standardized weekend of which they do sun worship, which they call Easter. But this is one of those months where, or one of those years where we actually get to see the big difference in the two is that Passover actually takes place later on in April this year, around April 22nd or April 20, somewhere around there, 17th through. It's an eight-day thing through the 25th. Um, and so, therefore, we know resurrection wouldn't actually take place until a month after, after we're going to celebrate it. However, my wife's birthday was on the 12th, and we have not stopped celebrating it since the beginning of the month till now. So we will honor Passover and resurrection 
on a standardized weekend, not for the sake of partaking in any paganness or anything like that, but because if someone is going to buy into the current flow of things, they're going to take you or go and tell them now. They've been trained to do so. So let us reach into the dark and pull them out. If you're online, don't invite anyone to Easter service. We don't have a such thing. We celebrate the resurrection. Um, but funny is Haman was historically crucified on Nisan 17. 17. This is when he died. And historically, the Messiah rose on Nisan 17. So Jesus is making us know that what was temporary, salvation, becomes eternal salvation. And when that thing is weak and put to death, in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. This is where the resurrection begins to happen. Haman was unwilling. He wanted glory for himself. And the difference between him and Jesus is Jesus was willing. He said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. I'm not slain by you. I lay it down. It's a sacrifice. You didn't kill me. You have no authority except for that which my father has given you. Naaman had people that were unwilling that he wanted to bow down to him because he exalted himself. But Jesus has us who are willing to bow down to him in every situation. Now there is a difference in the harlot and the bride here. Is if your heart won't allow you to bow down willingly to Jesus in every situation, then you might find yourself at the cross of Haman. You might find yourself at the altar of a harlot as opposed to a bride. And the marriage matters, you know why? Because there was Herodias and Herod. That's Mark chapter 6. There was David and Micah. And you read that in 1 Samuel 17. And there was Esther and Xerxes. You know, all these couples, while they were cute and lasting at times, they were all mixed matched. Now, I don't know if the term is mixed match or mismatched. When I was a child, I say Mitch match. <laughs> Mitch match socks. They, these are all mismatch. What you have with Herod and Herodias is you have an illegitimate marriage. What you have with Xerxes and Esther is you have a pagan king. And what you have with David and Micah is one that has a bride that won't worship. In fact, when it identifies Micah, it doesn't even identify her as Micah, David's wife. It identifies her as Micah, Saul's daughter. Because she could not come out of the world that she was born into, into the marriage that she was promised to. And a lot of believers have a problem today, coming out of the world they once lived in, the mindset they once lived in, to come into the marriage that we were promised and betrothed to, that Christ came to save us to, and she wouldn't worship. And she she mocked the worship and God dried her womb up. He made her barren. This offers us the problem because now we understand that where there is no worship, there is no reproduction. You cannot conceive where there is no worship. You cannot produce where there is no worship. And now you have a marriage that is barren. A marriage of promise turned into a eunuch. But now, Somebody shout now. now. Somebody shout I won't, I won't have. Now we have a legitimate marriage because the bridegroom is coming for his betrothed bride. Jesus is coming. Now. Somebody say now. now. We don't have a corrupt king. We have an incorruptible king. We have the most high God that is not corrupt, that there is no shadow of turning, that he does not change is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And now, somebody shout now. now. There is a bride that has to decide, will we worship or will we be silent? Who do we dance for, our king or for our lust? For our king or for a harlot? The bride has to decide, will you worship? Will your dance please him? Will your dance attract him? Will his kingdom 
be open to you. We sang a song coming in that said, King of glory, fill this place. I just want to be with you. You know, the scripture says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. It says, who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who is the King of glory? The Lord mighty in battle. Now understand this. If he is strong and mighty, and he is mighty in battle, when we sing, fill this place, we are not singing, fill this room. We are not singing, fill the sanctuary. We are declaring, fill this place. That's why you lift up your heads, O ye gates. Because it's your praise that gets you into the courts. It's your thanksgiving that gets you into the gates. And if you are the gate, when he enters, where is he entering but us? You understand the reason why we welcome him. The only place he does not go without being welcome is in us. Scripture say, if I ascend to the heaven, he is there. He didn't need my permission. If I make my bed in hell, he is there. He didn't need my permission. If I ran from him, mounted up with the wings of eagles and flew to the furthest side of the water, he is there for he did not need my permission. If I hid myself in the darkness and wrapped myself in it, it would become like light to him. Why? Because he did not need my permission. However, the king of glory says to us, lo, I stand at the door and I knock. I stand at the door and I knock. If any man opens unto me, I will enter and sup with him and him with me. The one place that he does not force himself is inside of you. And so we cry out, King of glory, King of glory, fill this place. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who do you dance for? Who do you please? Do you dance for your husband? Or do you dance for the world? My answer is always going to be worship. This sermon is always going to be worship. Everything we declare from this house is always going to be worship. For we exist to have true encounters with Jesus Christ. That we will be changed by him and then change the world for him. The call to worship never ends. You want to an answer to your problem? Worship. Maybe it ain't the answer you're seeking, but it's his presence that'll come in. You want to fix your health? Worship. Maybe it's the health of your faith that needs to be healed before the health of your body. If you need something fixed on the inside, worship. Because what happens is the king looks down and says, if he's pleased with you, ask whatever you want. I'll grant you whatever you want. Up to half the kingdom, just ask for it. Father, we thank you for who you are. You are strong and mighty, mighty in battle, holy and worthy, just, faithful, and true. So we lift you up, God, and we exalt you. We thank you, God, that you have prepared the legitimate marriage by your own blood covenant, by your own law. That it is built upon you and what you put together. Let no man put asunder. I bind the lies of men, God, the maneuvers of men. I bind up the maneuver of an enemy that would try to whisper against your word in every secret place. I bind it in Jesus' name, Father. I bind the bargains that the enemy tries to offer your people. Father, let us only dance for you. Father, break the, the perversion of the world and the spirit of Antichrist that tries to move within your people in Jesus' name. Father, we declare right now that we are your betrothed. And Father, if, it, if an enemy tries to assault your betrothed in your house, you send them to the gallows. We stand on that so we submit to you and resist the enemy that he will flee before you in Jesus' name. Amen.
when you came in, you received an envelope. The envelope says tithe and offering. We understand here that giving is an act of worship. Like I said, the call of this house is to worship. We honor the Lord with our possessions. We keep our covenant of the tithe. We give the sacrifice of praise also through an offering that everything that is released in here is released in heaven. That he smells the aroma of your worship on the altars. So we always take our time so you can hear the Holy Ghost tell you so that you can give what you have set in your heart to give and not out of compulsion. And that you can take time if you're mad about the offering to get it right with the Lord for he loves a cheerful giver. Now if you're not going to be cheerful, put it away. And then smile and take it back out. <laughs> be not deceived. God is not mocked. He, won't, he, he don't like it begrudgingly, but we'll accept it begrudgingly. <laughs> no, but it's always best to hear the Holy Ghost when you give, so you can never say a man convince you to do anything outside of the will of God. There'll be no one to blame when you stand there with you and God. And he'll look at you and you say, well, God, I was tricked. And he'll say, no, you mismanaged. Your giving to God holds you accountable to proper stewardship. There will never be blame to go around from management. Father, we thank you for the privilege to give to your kingdom. For everything that we have, it comes from you. You have given us the power to get wealth, God. You have given us breath in our lungs to work a job. You have kept us upright that our hands will be on the plow. And so, Father, we give you back our tithe, our covenant, uh, which is just a small amount, God. And we give you our offering, which is our worship and our sacrifice. And we ask, Lord, that you do more with it than is humanly possible, that you expand it, that you do miracles with it, God, that you gain the testimony and the glory for it. In Jesus' mighty name, Father, I pray that you send deals and bargains and equipping to your people that they would get it at cutthroat prices in these times of inflation because they have sown into your house that it will come back to them in good measure pressed down shaken together and running over father while others are being laid off let them be promoted and in this time of your provision father because you said preserve the oil and the wine i pray that you give them the discipline to store away Give them the anointing of Joseph to store away, Father, that when drought comes, that they are not without, but that they are anointed like Obed-Edom because they kept your presence in their home. In Jesus' name, amen.